Cool. So I'm going to talk about how we made the uh, L2 Arc persistent. Uh, before this project was merged, um, it is worth noting that the contents of the L2 Arc uh, were not persistent across your boots. So when you would export the tool or reboot the machine, you would lose the buffers on the L2 Arc. So how did we make a persistent L2 Arc happen? Um, first of all, the L2 Arc is a, a cache. It's a device that uh, caches buffers from uh, the Arc. And it is worth noting that it is a, a rotary implementation. So what happens, you can see a schematic at the bottom of the screen, is that we write buffers. And when the device is full, it will start evicting previously written buffers in order to make space uh, to write new ones. So the important thing to realize here is that it's a rotary implementation. It looks for the beginning if the device is full. Okay. So um, how did we make the uh, network persistent? We, um, first of all, to enable the persistence means that we need to restore the header entries of the buffers that uh, reside in L2R in the R. And to do this, we um, I implemented an on disk uh, structure called uh, L2R clock blocks. So, this is actually metadata that contains the buffer header entries. You can see their structure down here. So, it has a magic value for, them, for determining Indianness. It has a pointer to the previous slot block. And then it has the actual uh, header entries that are going to be restored in the arc. So, um, a lock block is written on the L2R arc every 1022 uh, buffers. We can see that it contains um, uh, things like uh, DVA, the transaction birth, the size of the buffer, compression algorithms, whether it was encrypted or uh, its data content type. So this is actually a subset of the ARC header that um, we restore when we do the rebuild of the L2R. Um, so this is actually how it looks uh, on disk. We have uh, the schematic at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have 1,022 buffers and then followed by a lock block, which actually contains the buffer header entries of the previous uh, 1,022 buffers. And then it uh, repeats uh, over and over again. So, okay, we have this uh, on uh, device structure, but how do we keep track of those lock blocks? I mentioned earlier that each uh, block contains a pointer to the previous uh, block. So that's how we can um, keep track of them. By information, I mean um, properties of the block, like its offset on the device, uh, the starting offset of the payload, the allocated size of its payload, uh, the, the size of the block itself, its compression algorithm. It's uh, worth noting that uh, normally uh, those lock blocks are compressed by using LC4. It's a checksum al algorithm and the checksum, of course. So we, for performance reasons, we don't actually have a single chain of uh, lock blocks, but we have uh, two interleaved chains. Uh, and you can see the, the schematic at the top of the slide. The concept here is that while we are issuing a synchronous read to read one lock block, we also issue an asynchronous read to read the immediately uh, prior one. So while we're decompressing and restoring the current lock block, uh, we spend the time to uh, read the previous one. And in terms of performance, you can see that in a consumer grade SATA SSD with a kind of old, uh, by nowadays standards, uh, Xeon processor. Um, restoring the contents of a 64 gigabyte L2 Arc device that corresponds to about 100 gigabytes in, uh, of buffers in terms of logical size. It takes about three seconds if we had just one uh, chain of lock blocks, and it takes about two seconds if we have the current design. So we have a performance gain of about 30%. It is also worth noting here that the L2 Arc is done asynchronously with respect to pull imports, so we don't actually um, uh, wait for the rebuild to finish to finish importing the pool. And it is also worth noting that uh, we don't write buffers to the cache device until the rebuild uh, has been completed. So now that we know all this information, uh, the question was, how do we actually start uh, the l 2 rebuild? To do this, uh, we implemented another on-device uh, structure, uh, the device header. Uh, this is updated each time a lock block is written to the cache device, and it contains pointers to the two most recently written lock blocks. So that's how we know which two lock blocks were lastly written on the device in order to start the rebuild. 
So, okay, all this is fine, but how do we stop the rebuild so as not to get into an endless loop of uh, restoring buffers over and over again? You can see a schematic at the bottom of the screen. Um, so we, we write, uh, as you look at the slide, from the left to the right. Uh, this is the writing direction. You can see that the most recently written lock block is this one. Um, and you can also see that ZFS has evicted ahead um, some space in order to uh, accommodate upcoming writes. And this is uh, uh, shown by the evict hand. So the evict hand is actually uh, the offset until which we've evicted buffers in order to make space for the new ones. When we start rebuilding the L2 arc, uh, we go the opposite direction than what we uh, read. So we go in this uh, schematic from right to left. So we'll start at the most recently written block and move backwards and then loop around. And once we uh, reach the evict hand, we stop the rebuild process. Um, it is also worth noting that the evict hand is stored in the device header. Um, and it is also useful because uh, if uh, trim is enabled on l work devices, then the range between the write offset and the evict hand might have been actually zeroed out. So it's uh, useful information to keep in the device header. In terms of uh, a module parameters, we introduced uh, two of them. Uh, one controls whether ZFS will attempt to repeat the end work. Uh, this means that uh, lock blocks, so metadata are still actually written in the device, but uh, once the pool is reported, the l 2 buffers are won't be restored. And the other actually decides completely the writing of uh, lock blocks on the cache device. And this may be beneficial for small devices. This one defaults to one gigabyte. So if the device is uh, smaller than one gigabyte, um, L2R persistence is disabled by default. Otherwise, it's enabled by default. So as soon as there is a cache device present, um, ZFS will start writing buffers and uh, uh, lock blocks to it, so the next time the pool is imported, it, the l 2 uh, buffers are going to be restored. Um, we have also taught uh, ZDB uh, to be able to uh, read um, those uh, on-device structures. So you can see the device header here, an example. You can see with uh, yellow the uh, offsets of the two most recently written lock blocks. You can also see information like uh, uh, their count, so 28 of them, their allocated size. And you can also uh, inspect uh, the content of the log blocks. For example, you can see here LB1, this is the first one, the most recently written one. You can see its compression algorithm, its checksum uh, algorithm. And you can also uh, inspect the buffer header entries for each uh, of its of its buffers, so things like the DPA, allocated size, the per transaction, compression levels, buffer content type, and so on. In terms of uh, arc stats, we implemented two sets of them. Uh, one set is updated online as um, writes are happening to the cache device, and you can see information like the number of the lock blocks, uh, their allocated size, and the other set has to do with the rebuild uh, process. So it tells us whether the repeat process was successful, how many log blocks were actually uh, uh, read, have been read, and in terms of the size of the buffers, uh, uh, how much is that? Uh, if you inspect the history of the pool with uh, Zpool, you can see if uh, the l 2 repeat was successful and how many blocks were actually restored. So with that, I'll be able to, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, George, you should be able to see them in the Q&A. Yes, I see them. So Nick is asking, what is the largest l device this has been tested with? Um, so personally, I've gone up to 128 gigabytes. Um, I'm pretty sure I was, um, I had seen a couple of uh, uh, pull requests in GitHub that mentioned uh, cache devices up to 2.5 terabytes. So unfortunately, I don't have one of those. Um, Yes, um, so in uh, personal testing up to uh, 128 uh, gigabytes. Uh, Jan asks, uh, how does network persistent impact pool times? Does the pool import block 
until the L twerk has been repopulated. No, it doesn't block it. So it happens. The L twerk rebuild has uh, is happening uh, asynchronously in the background, and this does not uh, impact uh, uh, importing uh, importing of the pool. Brian asks, uh, are there any operations that rebuild blocks until it finishes? No, um, it doesn't. So uh, it, is, it is an asynchronous operation. So pull import, uh, or even in the case of uh, offline, online uh, cache device, uh, it, it shouldn't be blocking anything. Uh, this um, has also been uh, manually tested by you know, putting uh, manually delays in the code to make sure it works as intended. So um, um, we haven't seen anything. And Becky asks, uh, so is mirroring the l 2 arc not necessary now? So this is an interesting uh, uh, concept, I think. I don't think that uh, uh, the L ZFS allows the l 2 arc to be mirrored. You can have multiple uh, cache devices in a single pool, but these are Stripe. These are, as far as I could tell from the code or the discussions we had, I don't think uh, ZFS in its current state allows mirroring the l devices. Um, if, some, uh, if someone else of the more dealt people to ZFS has a different uh, view, I'd be happy to hear it, but I don't think mirroring uh, the l is possible. Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, you might be thinking about the log. Yeah, All right. She, she just posted. She's thinking of the log. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the the log device is kind of totally. It's also an auxiliary device. It's also a way to like get better performance by using faster hardware. But uh, you know, because the L twerk isn't required for you know the integrity of the pool, uh, we didn't bother with uh, implementing mirroring for that. But yeah, for the log, you would you would still want to have mirroring. And I was going to add, it It might, you know, originally because we didn't have persistent L2 arc, it didn't make a lot of sense to actually build any, any redundancy. Now with persistent L2 arc, that may change for certain people and it may be a feature that you may want is the ability to have some redundancy for your L2 arc just because you want to be able to like, um, you know, preserve that in the event that something fails and you, you know, want to like reboot or something. Yeah, when we implemented L2 arc, um, at Oracle back when we decided not to put redundancy in simply because we viewed the actual data storage as the redundant component of the L2 arc. So you could always find the data back on disk if you needed to get it. Okay, uh, I have one final slide to show. So I'll go back to uh, sharing my screen. So uh, the status of this project, it has uh, already been merged. It is in master branch and it was in the upcoming OpenZFS 2.0. Um, this was a teamwork. So the implementation for the uh, persistent dev work um, started in Illumos, uh, I think five years ago or so. And uh, Shas is the one who did the original work. Then it was later reported on to ZFS on Linux by Yushon, and I actually picked up on the code uh, that uh, Jorgen had uh, lying around in the pull request. So I'm uh, very grateful for them. And also for everybody who uh, provided feedback, reviewed code, I've listed some of the people here. Uh, all in all, I think um, it, uh, it took me about five months to complete this work and uh, get it merged and the support of the OpenZFS community had been, has been great. So thank you uh, to all those people. And thank you to Mark again for providing me this opportunity. Cool, it looked like there was uh, one or two more questions. Oh um, yeah, there are you, a couple. If you would like. Um, so, Christian is asking, is the L2R code using the uh, ZIO pipeline? Uh, yes, I, th I guess, I'm pretty sure it does. So uh, the, the writes happening uh, are through uh, the ZIO pipeline, yeah. Uh, wouldn't receiver in the L2R negate all performance gains? So um, we're not actually receiving the L2R. Uh, we just go and read and restore in ARC the metadata the buffer header entries of the buffers that uh, lie there. Uh, 
So if we don't actually spend time checksumming, I mean, yes, we spend time checksumming and see if the checksums uh, of the lock blocks match and if they're valid. Uh, but at that point, it's only the lock blocks we care about, not the actual buffers. ZFS, when, when ZFS wants to, um, to read the block, it's, it's that time when it will do the checksumming and decide if the copy that is in the L2ARC is valid or not. So if this doesn't happen for the buffer itself, the checksum control doesn't happen at the time of the rebuild. At the time of the rebuild, all we care about is if the lock blocks are valid, so as to go ahead and restore um, uh, the arc, um, header entries. So uh, no, I don't think um, that um, this has an impact in uh, performance gains. And James is asking if writes to the pool happen before the L2ARC is repealed populated after a reboot, how is this kept in sync? For example, L2ARC contents don't match on this anymore. Yes, okay, this is a great question. So um, in terms of this, if, if, uh, say if the uh, contents of the disk change, but there is still information on L2ARC that is not up to date, uh, can ZFS will become aware of it if these um, uh, buffers or if these blocks are actually read. So it's then when ZFS will see that, okay, we, re we have information in the l 2 that doesn't match, the checksums don't match uh, what's in disk, so it will go on and fetch from disk, not from the l 2 So uh, in other words, when uh, contents on the, disk, on the disks are updated, it doesn't mean that the contents of the L2ARC will be immediately updated. Uh, the L2ARC caches buffers from the ARC, so uh, 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 there is a specific parameter that um, tells the ZFS how far to scan within the ARC for L2ARC uh, um, cacheable content. So um, when, when that area of, of the ARC is scanned, it's it's, that's when the l will get updated. If, again, if the contents on the disks are updated, it doesn't mean that the contents of the l will be automatically updated. Um, if there is a discrepancy, a ZFS will opt to read from the disks and not from the l content. Thank you, George. Um, if anybody else has more questions, uh, we're going to be having the breakout session uh, following right now. So thank you, George, yeah. for your presentation. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, George, and thanks uh, to whoever asked that last question. I think that's a definitely an interesting question, uh, especially because I think we try to make it so that in the normal case where there's no hardware problems, we we would like for ZFS to not be relying on the checksums in order to get correct behavior. Like the checksum is just supposed to be there to check that the hardware is doing the right thing. Um, so that would be an interesting area to do some more investigation and enhance the l 2 work. Um, so that we could know for sure that uh, the data that we're reading should be the right data, assuming that the hardware is okay.